This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Human Action Podcast. I'm going solo this week, and partly due to popular request, I am doing another episode where we're doing a deep dive back in the history of economic thought, and it also involves the difference between absolute and comparative advantage. So that's what we're going to get into. Let me just mention, if you listen to other podcasts that I host, I went over an example showing comparative advantage in that other series. And if you listen to that, you might think, oh, is Bob just double dipping? No, I'm not. It was precisely because of someone who heard my other episode and then challenged me. And that's what this is about. Okay, so I'll give you all the backstory and so forth. Don't worry, folks. Let me mention one last uh, commercial for this to tease to get you to do it, to listen. Uh, if you're an economics college professor and you teach this kind of stuff, particularly uh, absolute versus comparative advantage, you definitely want to listen to this episode. And I know there's probably at least several thousand either current or former college professors who listen to this ep- or this podcast. And so therefore, this one's for you. Before we get into the Good stuff, though, in terms of the content of today's episode. Let me make this announcement. Both political parties have let us down, and only a radical shift in ideas can offer a solution. And that's why the Mises Institute is giving away 100,000 copies of Murray Rothbard's What Has Government Done to Our Money? It's a powerful critique of fiat money and central bank-driven economic instability. This short book explains the history of money, its societal role, and why the state seeks to control it. Get your free copy today at Mises.org slash H-A-Pod free. Again, you want to get your free copy of Murray Rothbard's classic, What Has Government Done to Our Money? The Institute's giving away 100,000 copies of it. Go to Mises.org slash H-A-P-O-D-F-R-E-E. That's H-A-Pod free. Okay, so the backstory of what we're doing today is I recently was preparing a short lecture intended for a younger audience on comparative advantage. And I came up with some numbers that really told the story and showcased how uh, even if one country, if its workers are better at producing everything, every type of good, and when I say better, what I mean is If the workers in the rich country can make more units of every type of good per hour or per day or per year, whatever the time length we're going to pick, than the workers in some other country that's going to be a poorer country, one might have supposed that the richer country has no reason to trade with the poorer country, that there's no benefit to it. It it totally makes sense that why would a poorer country want to do business with a wealthier country where the workers are more physically productive, that makes sense. But one might have thought before studying economics, one might have thought that, oh yeah, a rich nation should just close off its uh, borders to international trade and that letting in imports from foreign countries where the workers aren't as productive, how could that possibly help us? That's what one might have thought. And what's also interesting in terms of the history of economic thought is Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations, which, remember, came out in 1776, he made a very strong case for opening up countries to international trade and that that was, in contrast to old-school mercantilism, which focused on trying to perpetually run trade surpluses so that the nation could accumulate gold and silver coin, Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations said, oh, no, actually, as the title suggests, the real cause of, a, of the wealth of nation is raising the standard of living, in our terminology, of, of the people. What, you know, what the flow of real goods and services they can enjoy during the course of the year, for example. It's not how many gold and silver coins can we stack up. That's not really of what our nation's wealth consists. Okay? But what was interesting is the actual illustrative examples that Adam Smith gave in The Wealth of Nations to show why uh, 
England might trade with Portugal or I forget off the top of my head the exact scenarios, but he came up with some stylistic examples showing how the people in England would have a higher standard of living if they focused on making the things that their workers were good at and let foreigners focus on the things that their workers were good at. And then you make more than what your people need domestically and you export the the surplus, but the people in the other country are doing the same thing. And then when all is said and done, the people in both countries get access to a wider variety of, of goods and services, right? So that's the idea. But the particular examples that Smith used in The Wealth of Nations, it was always the case that what the workers in a given country specialized in, the workers there happen to, in our modern terminology, have the absolute advantage, meaning the workers could crank out that product, like if it's bottles of wine in France, that the French workers could make more bottles of wine of a given quality per hour or per day than their English counterparts could. And the people in England, the workers there could make more sweaters, let's say, of a given quality and you know durability and so forth per year than their counterparts in France. And so then it made sense that the English would focus on making sweaters and the French would focus on making bottles of wine and they would trade with each other. All right, so there's nothing wrong with what Smith did, but the, uh, the limitation of his analysis or his demonstrations was that it might lead you to suppose, oh, there's only gains from international trade if you can find another country where the workers in that country are better at making some particular good than the workers in your country are. And then, yeah, you want to import that good from them because they can, you know, their workers per hour make more of that thing than yours do. So, yeah, that makes sense. But what was first fleshed out in David Ricardo's uh, 1817 principles book was the notion of comparative advantage. And so there, R Ricardo gave a numerical example showing how, no, even if the workers in one country can make both goods, and in these simplistic examples, there's always just two goods just to keep the, you know, to keep the analysis simple. Um, even if the workers in one country have the absolute advantage in both goods, still they can be wealthier, have a higher standard of living if they specialize in the good where their advantage is even is, is greater, right? So they're a little bit better at making one good and they're a lot better at making a second good. So they should specialize, put up their workers into the thing where they really have the advantage and let the other country whose workers are inferior in a sense in both lines focus on the thing where the rich country's advantage is the smallest, if, they, if you get my terminology. Okay, so that's what Ricardo did. And so economists, that distinction, they refer to it as absolute versus comparative advantage. Okay, so again, just to summarize, we would say in modern terminology, Adam Smith showed the advantages of specialization in international trade but the examples he used to illustrate it were all ones where one country had the absolute advantage in one good and the other country had the absolute advantage in the other good. So again, it wasn't that what he wrote was wrong, but that might lead you to think the gains from trade were only applicable in a limited number of situations where countries were trading among their peers economically, if you want to think like that. Whereas what Ricardo showed is, oh no, the scope for gains from trade is much wider than that. Because again, he gave numerical example showing even if one country is, its workers are more productive in either line, still that country gains materially by focusing on the line where it has um, the, the greatest advantage or the greater if we're only talking about two goods. And that's, what's, well, that's what we mean by comparative advantage, okay? So I, uh, like I say, in a different podcast series, I went through an example and then I wrote an article just spelling out the, the numerical example at the uh, Infinio website where I work. And I posted that on Twitter, 
or X, as some prefer to call it. And then I got pushback from an economist, I hope I'm pronouncing his name, Jorge Morales Miyaqui. And he has a paper called Overcoming Absolute and Comparative Advantage, a reappraisal of the relative cheapness of foreign commodities as the basis of international trade. And at first I was somewhat taken aback and he, he was saying, I'm paraphrasing, but you know, Robert, you're, uh, you're playing into this standard narrative that uh, plays off Adam Smith's absolute advantage versus David Ricardo's comparative advantage as if the two authors had different theories of explaining, you know, what should guide trade policy. But no, he said, uh, both Adam Smith and David Ricardo had the same view, namely that a country benefits when it imports goods that can be produced more cheaply abroad than can be pr produced domestically. And that's the rule, and that's the same in the Wealth of Nations, and it's the same in David Ricardo's principles. And so modern economists should drop this alleged dichotomy of Smith's absolute advantage framework versus Ricardo's comparative advantage framework. Okay, so I was surprised initially when I saw his thesis because I thought, well, yeah, doesn't everybody know that? Of course, from the perspective of the individual market participants, you know, they don't, they're not taking out spreadsheets and writing down worker productivities and calculating what's the comparative advantage. No, they just go out in the marketplace and they want to buy a good and they just see who, who's offering to me on the cheapest terms, you know, adjusting for quality. And if some foreign country's uh, businesses hiring foreign workers can make the thing more cheaply and send it over here, as long as the government doesn't have you know high tariffs or quota systems in place and it can freely cross the border and come in, well, then, yeah, I, as a consumer, I'm going to buy the product from the person that can sell it to me at the lowest price. So I thought that was obvious. And the mo when I read... Jorge's paper, I realized, oh, I do see why there is a lot of confusion here. And so a lot of it historically, I, I claim, emanates from the fact that the classical economists had a labor theory of value, right? So I'm going to read excerpts from the classical economists to confirm what I'm saying here or to, or to give support for it. Uh, but let me just mention when we say that, when we say the classical economists like Adam Smith and David Ricardo especially ha held a labor theory of value, it's not the crude, obviously false theory that says, oh, the more labor hours somebody puts into an object, the more value that accrues into it. And that's like a, a causal mechanism, just like if you pour water into a pitcher, it fills up with water. And, and like that, that's, yeah, so the amount of water in the pitcher is due to how much you poured into it. And so therefore the economic value inherent in a good has to do with how many labor hours did you put into it. No, that's not what they meant, all right? What they meant was, in, in modern terminology, in many situations, in equilibrium, it will be the case that the market exchange value of commodities will be proportional to the amount of labor hours that went into their production, All right? So if it took 100 man hours to make good A and it only took 50 man hours to make good B, then good A is going to have twice as high a price in the market as good B in long-run equilibrium, All right? That's, and if you say, well, what if there's more things besides labor that's required? Well, yeah, they can push it back and say, all right, the other stuff too that you have in mind, like the... um semi-finished goods and other inputs in that last step that are all combined together in a recipe with more labor to make the finished good, you can decompose those other inputs and say, well, how, how many labor hours went into those other factors? And so you can ultimately like look back through the, the chain of history to see how many total labor hours went into this thing. And then when you add up that, you get the idea of, okay, so clearly... You know, in long-run equilibrium, again, the finished market price of some good or commodity has to be proportional to the total amount of labor hours that went into it. 
Okay, so that's the kind of statement that the classical economists had in mind when they would write things that if you just looked at the sentences in isolation, you would think, oh, they think value is determined by labor input. Geez, don't they know that it has to do with supply and demand? Or don't they know that human preferences and utility have something to do with it? Yes, they, they did know all that. Okay, but again, they just didn't, until the marginal revolution of the early 1870s, their framework, they were just kind of stumbling around and the sorts of propositions that they landed on to think this is the sorts of statements we want to make to get our hands around this phenomenon of market prices, they made a bunch of statements about, and again, in our, in our terminology, long-run equilibrium having to do with reproducible commodities. That's the kind of thing. And so, yes, it is true under a bunch of assumptions that the market price of good A compared to market price of good B will be proportional to the total labor hours that went into their production. So that is true, but you can see why we've, we stop even using that terminology and that framework because it's just cumbersome, even though it's not technically wrong, okay? So let me now, I think what I'll do is read some excerpts from Jorge's paper to show you what I mean. And then after I get through that, the thing I'll end this episode of the Human Action Podcast on is I will pull up some lecture notes that I made for my students way back in 2005 when I was a professor at Hillsdale College. And there I spelled out some stuff about comparative advantage and I gave dollar figures just to show what things would look like from the point of view of the individual market participants in a you know before scenario where there's a big trade wall that's preventing goods from crossing borders. And then we remove the trade barrier and allow unfettered free trade and prices and wages adjust and just to show what that looks like. Okay, so let me just mention it right now to make sure it doesn't get lost in the shuffle. Again, my position throughout all of this has been Adam Smith and David Ricardo both thought a nation benefits by importing those goods that foreign nations can produce more cheaply, but still to understand where is that coming from? Why, why are they able to do that? Adam Smith gave numerical examples that focused on cases of absolute advantage, whereas David Ricardo gave examples that showed the principle was more general and that even, again, I'm not going to rehash what I said earlier. So to me, it's not that you know, oh, well, which is it? Does a nation benefit by focusing on comparative advantage or by focusing on where you get goods cheapest? To me, that those are two different ways of getting at the same underlying thing, or at least one thing is the cause of the other, to put it that way. All right, so I just want to state that, and then trust me, folks, hang in there. I will give you a literal numerical example, spelling out and showing you exactly what I mean, but let me conclude with that example. Let me first just read some excerpts from these various classical economists so you understand what, what the confusion is. Okay, so again, I'm getting all these quotes uh, from Jorge's paper, and uh, obviously I'll link to this stuff in the show notes page. Okay, so he, he starts his paper with a quote from David Ricardo's principles saying, the motive which determines us to import a commodity is the discovery of its relative cheapness abroad. It is the comparison of its price abroad with its price at home. And then, again, Jorge's point is he's going to say Smith and Ricardo agreed on that. So let me first read from Adam Smith. So these are some pretty famous excerpts from The Wealth of Nations. So again, The Wealth of Nations comes out in 1776. So here's one of the most famous parts of that. This is Adam Smith. What is prudence in the conduct of every private family can scarce be folly in that of a great kingdom. If a foreign country can supply us with a commodity cheaper than we ourselves can make it, better buy it of them with some part of the produce of our own industry employed in a way in which we have some advantage. All right, and then he also says, 
This is, again, Smith from The Wealth of Nations. In every country, it always is and must be the interest of the great body of the people to buy whatever they want of those who sell it cheapest. Okay? So there, you see that, yes, Smith is clearly enunciating the principle that we should import those goods that foreigners can make more cheaply than we can domestically with our own workers. But notice, even there, this it's slipped in if you wanted to understand, okay, but under what circumstances will that be the case that some foreign country, its workers can make it more cheaply than our workers can? And here, I'm just going to reread what I said there. If a foreign country can supply us with a commodity cheaper than we ourselves can make it, better buy it of them with some part of the produce of our own industry employed in a way in which we have some advantage. Okay, so you see how that's leading you to believe, oh, okay, so the way we come up with the ability to buy it from them, to import it from them, is we got to send them our stuff. They're not just going to send us their products for free. And he said, we should focus on the things where we have some advantage. So you see how even right there, then coupled with his, his numerical examples, one might think this can only happen if, um, you know, each country is focusing on the area where they have some advantage. And then it just remains to be seen what, what's the advantage of what does it consist. And that's why, again, Smith's numerical examples might lead you to erroneously limit the scope of the gains from trade. Okay, so now let me... Um, I think the next thing I want to read is um, John Stuart Mill. So what's interesting is Jorge points out that in Ricardo's Principles book of 1817, Given the way that a modern economists teach the history of economic thought, you might have thought that Ricardo has a big section on comparative advantage and that he goes through and says, ah, I'm going to extend the insights of Adam Smith and show you it was even a more general situation. That, no, that's not what happens. He doesn't, he, I think he does use the phrase comparative advantage, but in context, it clearly isn't talking about what we mean by that phrase. Where this distinction, this dichotomy between absolute and comparative advantage comes from is not until John Stuart Mill in his 1844 book. And um, it's, a, it's a collection of essays. So it's called Essays on Some Unsettled Questions of Political Economy. So uh, Jorge says here that these essays were actually written, we think, like between 1829 and 1830, but they just didn't get published as a collection until 1844, for what that's worth. Okay, so now let me read you this from John Stuart Mill. To render the importation of an article more advantageous than its production, it is not necessary that the foreign country should be able to produce it with less labor and capital than ourselves. We may even have a positive advantage in its production. But if we are so far favored by circumstances as to have a still greater positive advantage in the production of some other article, which is in demand in the foreign country, we may be able to obtain a greater return to our labor and capital by employing none of it in producing the article in which our advantage is least, but devoting it all to the production of that in which our advantage is greatest, and giving this to the foreign country in exchange for the other. It is not a difference in the absolute cost of production, which determines the interchange, but a difference in the comparative cost. Okay, so you see there, clearly that's what modern economists, when we teach this stuff in the history of economic thought or even just in standard micro or maybe international trade classes, to the extent that anyone does give a nod to the history of this to say, you know, the difference between two, clearly that's what we're getting at, what John Stuart Mill just put his finger on. And let me just also say, the numerical example I'm going to give here in a few minutes shows exactly what Mill's talking about. In the example I'm going to show, the U.S. is going to have the absolute advantage in both of two possible goods, and yet it's going to open up to trade with Mexico, and the U.S. is going to totally focus on one of those goods where its advantage is the greatest or the greater, and 
just just use its workers to just make that good and then ship some of that to Mexico in exchange for the other thing. And that's going to make the U.S. workers better off than if they just produced themselves the goods that Americans were going to consume. Okay? So I'm going to give you specific numbers to show you how that works. So that's clearly what Mill is getting at. So what's interesting, though, is there he wasn't talking about absolute advantage and comparative advantage. He said cost. And so this is what I'm saying is the confusion here, or part of it, has to do with the fact that the classical economists, as great as they were, they still were hamstrung by this cost or labor theory of value. And again, that phrase is not a crude, simplistic formula like, oh, the more labor hours that go into it, the final price has to go up. And no, like if, if a bunch of workers just keep digging a hole and filling it back up, it's not that they get to charge somebody a billion dollars for that thing, or you get a mud pie and some other people put some rat poison in it and some other people spend a lot of time putting all kinds of other broken glass in it and then you want to sell that cake to somebody or pie. The fact that you put in a lot of labor hours doesn't mean anyone's going to pay you for it, right? So obviously the labor theory of value, when we say that phrase, we don't mean ridiculous versions of what the words might be construed to mean. Okay, the classical economists were not stupid. They meant something that was correct it was just a very, in, from our modern perspective, convoluted way of trying to get at the problem and that the marginal subjective revolution ushered in in the 1870s just showed, no, there's a much more straightforward way that we can explain market prices. Everything that the old classical economists could do while using the labor theory of value or the cost theory of value, we can do with the modern theory too and we can explain other cases too, like a, a Van Gogh painting, you know, from our perspective <laughs> at the time, they wouldn't have talked about that. A Van Gogh painting now, obviously talking about the labor theory of value and how many hours when it has nothing to do with it, right? Because it's not reproducible. So the modern subjective theory of value can handle the general phenomenon, including the more typical cases that the classical cool school could only explain those ones. Okay, so let me now just read a little bit um, from Ricardo to show why his uh, reliance on a labor theory of value confused him or, or sowed confusion when it came to his approach to international trade. Okay, so... Um, and this, to me, is the decisive one. So Ricardo says um, in the section where he's going to go over his numerical example that is going to illustrate what nowadays we would look at that and say, oh, yeah, he's just showing the possibility, you know, how comparative advantage works when it comes to international trade and that even one country has the absolute advantage of both, blah, 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 right? This is what Ricardo's, what he said commenting on this numerical example, what he said the point of it was. What was he trying to get across? And he says, quote, the same rule which regulates the relative value of commodities in one country does not regulate the relative value of the commodities exchanged between two or more countries. All right, so you see right there, Ricardo thinks that what we now call cases of comparative advantage, he thought, that, oh, what this is underscoring is that we got to be careful. The way, the, the rule that we use to explain market value amongst commodities domestically, that rule doesn't work if you're looking at potential foreign imports. All right. And so from a modern perspective, it's like, what are you talking about? No, we, we use the same theory of value to explain everything. What are you talking about? It doesn't matter whether it's domestically made or foreign made. But to see why he said that, what might strike us as odd why he made that odd statement, let me just show you what he what he means. So again, once you know what he's saying, it's like, oh, okay. And I would just say from our modern perspective, okay, so that's why, Ricardo, you should drop that framework. And that's why we don't use those, quote, principles or rules to explain the price of commodities because look at the knots you're getting tied into. Okay, so let me find, uh, okay, so this is Ricardo commenting on, you know, his numerical example. <clears throat> 
Thus, England would give the produce of the labor of 100 men for the produce of the labor of 80. Actually, let me back up. Um, so this is Jorge given some of the context for this quote because you need to know the context. Otherwise, what Ricardo is saying doesn't make any sense. So this is Jorge setting up this quotation from Ricardo. In the featured barter trade in chapter 7 of the principles, an unspecified amount of cloth produced by 100 Englishmen working for a year is exported to Portugal in exchange for an unspecified amount of wine, which required the labor of 80 Portuguese men also working for a year. Okay, so again, the cloth from England, it took 100 workers a year to make. And then they ship that, they export that, and in return, they import uh, wine from Portugal that it happened to take 80 workers a year in Portugal to make all that wine, and that's what traded. This exchange of unequal quantities of labor could not take place between individuals of the same country, as Ricardo indicated in the following paragraph. All right, so now I'm reading Ricardo talking about that numerical example. Thus, England would give the produce of the labor of 100 men for the produce of the labor of 80. Such an exchange could not take place between the individuals of the same country. The labor of 100 Englishmen cannot be given for that of 80 Englishmen, but the produce of the labor of 100 Englishmen may be given for the produce of the labor, labor of 80 Portuguese, 60 Russians, or 120 East Indians. The difference in this respect between a single country and many is easily accounted for by considering the difficulty with which capital moves from one country to another to seek a more profitable employment and the activity with which it invariably passes from one province to another in the same country. Okay, so Ricardo is saying there that the reason this mismatch persists, right? So again, he's saying, within your own country, within England, it couldn't possibly be that a commodity that took work 80 workers, or sorry, 100 workers a year to make trades for a different commodity that took 80 workers in England a year to make. Because in his mind, no, clearly the one th thing, you know, would, would be worth 100 pounds or shillings or whatever we're, you know, unit we're using, well, it'd be a lot more if it took a year. Um, but it, it would be, you know, that thing would have a value of 100, whatever the units are, and the other thing would only have a value of 80. They couldn't possibly trade on equal terms because if they could, then, you know, the, the idea is the cost of production of the thing that only took 80 worker years to make is lower than the other thing. So the, the rate of profit would have to be higher. So capital would move out of the thing that was taking 100 worker years to make and flow into the other sector. That's the idea. Okay. So, um, just right there. So he's trying to explain, Ricardo's trying to say, so how can it be that this imbalance does, can persist when it comes to international trade? And he's saying, oh, the, the difference is domestically, yeah, capital can just easily move around. And so clearly if the rate of profit were higher, in the good that only took 80 worker hours, because right, the wage bill would be lower, the wage cost would be lower, the capital would just flow until the profit rates were equalized, in which case it's got to be true in equilibrium that something that takes 100 worker hours, or sorry, worker years to make can only trade for something else that also takes 100 worker years to make. That's right. That's where they're coming from. Oh, but the reason that principle doesn't hold for international trade is for various reasons, institutional and logistical Capital can't flow that easily between countries. Goods can flow, but not the capital. And also, you know, workers can't either, but, right? So that's what he's putting his face. So, I mean, that, that is true that, yes, goods can more easily cross borders than capital can, certainly back when he was writing. But to me, that's, that's not the way to resolve this paradox because I would st start and say, no, in general, it's not true that something that has, that takes 100 worker years couldn't trade for something that takes 80 worker years, right? Because there, you're assuming all the labor is homogenous, right? And so, because in general, yeah, the something that takes 100 teenagers to produce certainly could trade for something that only takes one brain surgeon to produce. That's, that's not a contradiction. 
right? So I'm just saying when you start getting into what the um, the assumptions behind your analysis, so clearly for that proposition to make sense where you say the value of the commodities have to trade in or have to be proportional to the amount of labor hours in them, you're assuming all the workers are identical and interchangeable. Otherwise, there's no reason to suppose that would be true. So then once you say that though, okay, so then the fact that the goods made in England with a certain number of labor hours required trade for other goods on the, in the international trade market that don't take the same number of labor hours from foreigners, well, one obvious way to address that is to, or to explain that seeming anomaly is to say, because the workers aren't interchangeable. English workers could be more productive than foreign workers or vice versa. And so there's no reason to support, right? So anyway, that's partly what I'm getting. And David Ricardo knows all this, right? I'm not saying that David Ricardo was walking around thinking that some lawyer with 30 years of experience was just as productive and was interchangeable with some 18-year-old kid who's just learned how to become a blacksmith or something. He, he, he wasn't stupid. He obviously knew workers weren't interchangeable. It was just in his model to keep things simple. At first, they made some simplifying assumptions and, did, did, and built up principle. Okay, I get all that. But again, my, my point is just given that that's the road they went down, you see the, the weird position he was put into where it seemed like a paradox, like, oh, how come it is that we have these different principles that seem to apply regulating the value of commodities? And then he puts his finger on, oh, it's because capital doesn't flow as easily between country. And again, I'm, I'm saying that it is true institutionally, but that that's not, in my view, the decisive reason. Even in a world where capital does flow, it could still be the case that the workers in some other country are not as productive. Either they're more productive or they're less productive for various reasons. Okay. And so, again, I think I'm done reading the quotes here, but I was just trying to underscore why uh, Ricardo, I think, was getting tripped up. And, you, and so given that that's how Ricardo was talking about, you see what John Stuart Mill was doing when he was talking about absolute cost versus comparative cost. Because that was the, when they were, to the classical economists, to talk about labor hours going into the production of different commodities – that was the same thing as talking about the cost of production because that's kind of how they measured it. And I, I, again, I'm just beating a dead horse here. That's not a helpful way to think about it. It's not that, yeah, start with that as a simplifying case and then start relaxing. No, don't start with that. <laughs> that's kind of what where we're, we're, we've come down on. Okay, so big picture. I agree with Jorge Morales Miyoki that uh, perhaps many modern textbook writers don't understand all these nuances. And certainly, I agree with him that both Adam Smith and David Ricardo thought a nation benefits from the possibility of trade with other countries by importing those goods that the other country can make more cheaply than we can make it domestically. But having said that, when, when then both Smith and Ricardo went to elaborate on that, what we now refer to as absolute versus comparative advantage was definitely part of that explanation. And I would say Ricardo's exposition was muddied by his labor theory of value framework. Okay, so now, having gone through all that, let me conclude this episode by just going through a numerical example that I came up with, again, this particular one, I found this, I went through my hard drive. It, it took a while for me to find this thing. I had to like Google and figure out how do you, anyway, it's not worth it. I'm a boomer at this point, uh, at least in spirit. But I did manage to dig up this thing that was from 2005 that I would teach to the students at Hillsdale. So we'll flash up on the screen uh, these numbers and such so that it's easier if you're watching the video here that you don't have to try to keep track of numbers. Okay, so the story is, the scenario is, we're looking at trade between the U.S. and Mexico. And the two possible goods are TVs and DVDs. And the idea is, or the story is, 
the U.S. workers, if they just focus on TVs, can make two per day. You know, so a given worker can make two television sets per day, or a given U.S. worker can make five DVDs per day. In these examples, we don't worry about other inputs just to keep stuff simple, All right? That's the idea. In Mexico, in contrast, a given worker spending a day making TVs actually can only make one. If he instead focuses on DVDs, he can make two per day. All right, so with those numbers, the U.S. has the absolute advantage in both TV and DVD production. Again, just to remind you, the U.S. has a two-to-one advantage in TVs. A U.S. worker can make two TVs per day versus Mexico can make one per day. And in DVDs, the U.S. has a five-to-two advantage. The U.S. worker can make five DVDs a day. Mexican worker can only make two. So if you have worked with these examples before, you know how it's going to turn out. I'll just anticipate that just to end your suspense. So even though the U.S. has the absolute advantage in both, and you might think there's no gains from trade, the U.S. should just use its own workers to make DVDs and TVs in whatever proportion the consumers want, that that's not the case. That the U.S. actually benefits if it specializes in DVD production and Mexico specializes in television production. And the reason is because the U.S., although has the absolute advantage in both, it only has the comparative advantage in DVDs. And how do you know that? Because the U.S. advantage in TVs is two to one. In DVDs, it's five to two, right? So it's more than double. And so that's why the, the relative advantage for the U.S. in DVD production is higher. Okay, so, so far, this is pretty straightforward stuff. What may be new, and, and partly why I'm doing this is it, in response to Jorge's article, and he, I didn't read it to you folks here, but he had some quotes from modern authors, economists, commenting on all this stuff. And I agree that some of them might uh, miss some of these nuances. So when I was writing up these numerical examples back in 2005, I thought this was all standard stuff and everybody knew this. And now I'm open to the idea that maybe they don't. Okay. I'm not saying Paul Samuelson didn't know this or Paul Krugman even doesn't know. I'm not saying that. By the way, for Krugman, his Nobel Prize was in international trade theory. So yes, Krugman knows this stuff. But I just mean people teach you this in an undergrad setting or historians of economic thought. Maybe they've never worked through this. So that's partly why I'm doing this now, just to, to give back to the community, to save you some time in case you've never worked through this. Okay, so here's what we're doing. I'm just going to give dollar figures to these things just to show you what it might look like from the perspective of the actual entrepreneurs and workers in the U.S. and Mexico. So first, we're going to assume there's autarky, meaning there's no trade. So maybe Trump built a big wall protecting the U.S. from cheap Mexican imports. And this is what the situation looks like. I assume that the wage rate in the U.S. is $100 a day you know, per worker, a worker gets $100 a day. The TV price is $50 and a DVD price is 20. So notice those numbers all line up with the production amounts that I said a few minutes ago, right? Because a, a US worker can make two TVs per day. So if TVs are $50 each, that's $100 in market value. And we assume the US worker gets paid $100 in a daily wage rate. All right, again, with these stuff, just we're not worried about profit and so forth. Just the worker gets paid his marginal product. That's it. Just keep stuff real simple. In contrast, DVDs, we assume they have a price of 20. The U.S. worker, we suppose, could make five per day. So five times 20 is 100. So the U.S. worker in DVD production also gets paid his marginal product. He makes $100 worth of DVDs in a day. And under these, this price structure, that's what he gets paid in wages. Okay? In Mexico... I picked the numbers to be the, the wage rate is $10 a day for a given worker. TVs sell for $10 a television set and DVDs sell for $5 each. And so again, if you run those numbers, that fits the production possibilities that I said a few minutes ago. Namely, a Mexican worker makes one TV per day. So if they sell for $10, that's why the wage rate has to be $10 per worker per day in Mexico. Or they make two DVDs. And so if DVDs sell for $5 in Mexico, 
two times five is 10 again. So notice both in the US market and the Mexican market, workers get paid the same regardless of which industry they're in and everything works out so there's no profit. Like all the firms are just breaking even, okay? Now it's true, the Mexican worker is only making $10 a day and the US worker is making $100 a day, but that's sustainable because we assume that there's a wall that keeps not only goods out, but also workers, right? So with all this stuff, we assume the workers are fixed. Right? If you relax that, then that would change things and, and so on, okay? Okay, so now what happens if a free trading policy is implemented, they get rid of that wall, so they still keep the workers on both sides of the border, right? So the Mexican workers still stay in Mexico and the U.S. workers still stay in the U.S., but now TVs and DVDs are allowed to cross the border in international trade. What happens? I pick numbers that make the story work, all right? So they wouldn't have to be these numbers, but these are all consistent internally, I said, suppose now in the new equilibrium, U.S. wages have fallen to $50 a day, TV prices have fallen to $22 each, and DVD prices have fallen to $10 each. All right, so in, in Mexico, wages have risen to $22 a day, TV prices have risen to $22 a day, and DVD prices have risen to $10. I shouldn't have said per day. TV price is just $22 per set. And DVDs are $10, okay? So what's happened now, given that those are the prices, so it makes sense, right, that when you open it up to trade, um, the, in a sense, the cheap Mexican goods have pulled down U.S. prices and wage rates. And from the Mexicans' point of view, opening up trade to the rich U.S. country has, has pulled up their wages and prices. By the way, with this stuff, I just put it all in dollar terms. If you wanted, you could introduce pesos, and then you'd have to worry about the U.S. dollar peso exchange rate. So that's just another complicated. That's not going to change the essence of the story. All right. If you wanted to, you could like think in terms back of a classical gold standard and have everything quoted in ounces of gold, and so that everybody's implicitly using the same money, or at least you know the domestic currency trades at a fixed weight for gold, and then you could run through and come up with the implied exchange rates. You could do that stuff too, if you want. All right. But just to, to focus on the thing I want to focus on, I'm just assuming everybody gets paid in in U.S. dollars, even though that's not realistic. All right. But I'm promising you that doesn't change the story. That would just be another level of complication that we would have to worry about what's the peso U.S. dollar exchange rate, okay? If you want, you can go ahead and write that on the side and, and change my numbers so that the Mexicans are being paid in pesos and their goods are priced in pesos, but you're going to see the, quote, real exchange rates and so forth are all working out to the numbers I'm saying, or at least you could pick the numbers to still tell this story. Okay, so what you know? What can we say now about this new equilibrium? What's happening? Well, the big picture is the U.S. is focusing on DVD production. All the U.S. workers now are only making DVDs, and all the Mexican workers are only making television sets. And the reason that happens, so we can, we kind of quote know that is omniscient economists looking at the the numbers, the production figures that I said in the beginning of this example, because, you know, oh, the U.S. has the comparative advantage in DVD production and the Mexico has the comparative advantage in TV production. So we know there's going to be gains from trade if they specialize in that and then, you know, trade the surplus. We know that. But again, how does the, the entrepreneur on the ground know that once the barriers to trade are removed? And so from the entrepreneur's perspective, the, the people that were originally making television sets in the U.S. using U.S. workers is the, quote, cheap foreign goods come in that's going to push down TV prices. So originally, remember, TV prices were $50, and now they, they finally land at $22. Now, it's also true, workers' wages in the U.S. are falling, but when, when everything stops in the new equilibrium, they haven't fallen enough. Wages haven't. Because the people making TVs are going to say, okay, okay, 
now the new price is $22 per set. The workers still physically can just make two of them, right? So opening up to trade doesn't change the, the physical productivities of the workers. So U.S. workers can still only make two TVs per day. So if now they're selling for $22 each, that's only $44 a day in revenue. So if U.S. wages have only fallen to $50 per day, we can no longer afford to keep Americans making TVs, right? That we're just being undercut by these cheap Mexican TVs and we can no longer, it, it doesn't pay to keep Americans making that. And so all of the previous U.S. manufacturers of television sets lay off all their workers and go out of business. And then now those workers get absorbed into DVD production. And it might be tumultuous, and that might partly be why their wages are falling. Like, oh my gosh, we used to be making $100 a day. And then these idiot economists believing in laissez-faire told our government to get rid of the trade barrier. Now all these cheap Mexican TVs come in. How can we be expected? We get laid off and our wages have fallen from $100 a day down to $50 a day. And we have to go work out the DVD plant. So how can the DVD plant afford to stay in business? in the US. Well, again, prices have fallen in half down to $10 per DVD. They originally were 20, but workers' wages have also fallen in half. So the DVD manufacturers in the US are still able to stay in business. That a worker makes five per day still. And so five times $10 each is $50 a day. And that's what the workers now get paid. Okay. So again, with these, this example is assuming what's called constant returns to scale. Right, So the fact that we moved a bunch more workers into DVD production didn't change on the margin how many physical DVDs a worker can make per day. Right? If you want to get more realistic and complicated, you can put all those bells and whistles into it. And that's actually re related to the stuff Paul Krugman won the Nobel Prize for, believe it or not. Okay, But I'm just explaining to you what's going on in these examples. Okay. So that's what happens there. In Mexico, I'll go through this more quickly. From their perspective, what happens is um, they can, the TV producers, it's like, oh, we opened up by removing the trade barriers. Our market was opened up and now the wealthy American consumers can also buy our TVs. And so that bid up the price. Originally, our TVs in the protected Mexican market were selling for $10 a piece. Now that we've opened up our market to the Americans, TV prices get bid up to $22. And you might have thought, oh, well, then how can we possibly still, or, or sorry, um, you might think, oh, so now there's going to be uh, profit in that industry. Well, no, because workers' wages in Mexico also got bid up. And so in the new equilibrium, workers are making $22 a day in Mexico. And that's exactly, you know, what they're generating for the employer by making one TV per day that they still physically do. In contrast, the DVD producers, they see their prices double, right? DVDs in Mexico originally were $5, opening up trade to the United States. Now DVD prices double to $10 each. But because workers' wages more than doubled, now those manufacturers can't stay in business, All right? So from their point of view, it's, ah, opening up trade with the United States was stupid because now that pushed up workers' wages here in Mexico so that we can't even compete anymore because those American workers are, man, they're just so productive that they can make, they can, you know, they, for their given day, their workers can crank out so many DVDs. How can we compete with that? And so that's why the Mexican DVD producers are mad that their government foolishly went along with this free trade policy and they go out of business, lay off the Mexican DVD workers who then get absorbed into TV production in Mexico. Okay, so that's the way this stuff works. Last thing I'll say here before I wrap up is just what, what's the, what are the gains from this? Again, very simplistic example. Let me just mention, if the workers aren't interchangeable, then the story is different. All right, but we're assuming in this story that the workers in the U.S. are interchangeable with each other and the workers in Mexico are interchangeable with each other. So to see the gain to the U.S. worker, notice that before trade with Mexico, they could take a day's wages, 
it, it didn't matter which line they were in. They were making $100 per day, whether they made TVs or uh, DVDs in the, in the original equilibrium before trade. And if they wanted to spend their wages on TVs, they could get two of them. Or if they wanted to spend their wages on DVDs, they could get five. Right, so the U.S. workers in the original equilibrium could take a day's worth of wages and buy either two TV sets or five DVDs. So now, what's their real standard of living in the new equilibrium? Well, with a day's wages, they can still buy five DVDs, right? Because they get paid now fifty dollars a day, but DVD prices have fallen to ten dollars. So they're no worse off if all they like are DVDs, but they're better off with TVs, right? Because their wages have fallen in half, but TV prices have fallen by more than that, right? TV prices dropped from $50 down to 22, right? So if, 50, if, the, if TV prices had dropped from 50 to 25, then it would just be a wash. But no, they fell a little bit more to 22. And so that's the sense in which U.S. workers now have a higher standard of living. Their real wages are higher now than they were before. If all they do is just buy DVDs, it's a wash. And that makes sense, Right. It'd be weird uh, that, um, you know, for them benefiting from trade if all they did was to keep consuming the thing that they made domestically. But to the extent that they, in their purchases, ever work in TVs, the fact that they can now get TVs on cheaper terms from Mexico matters, right? It benefits them, all right? And then... I'll do it just for completeness. It's not surprising that the Mexican workers benefit, and it's a similar thing, that the Mexican workers originally, with their daily wages, had the purchasing power to get either one TV or two DVDs. Now in the new equilibrium, with a day's wages of, again, $22, they can still just get one TV if they want, but they can get more than two DVDs, Right because two TVDs would cost $20, but their wage rates now per day are 22, All right? So that's the sense in which the Mexicans' real wages have also increased. Okay, so again, big picture, this example is clearly relying on what we mean by comparative advantage and showing the gains from trade. And yet by me plugging in numbers that are all internally consistent with the story, I was telling you with the before and after, I'm showing that each country imports those goods that can be made more cheaply abroad. And that shows the advantages from trade. Incidentally, notice too, it doesn't mean that the goods have different prices, right? Once you open it up completely to free trade, the goods are going to sell for the same price in both places, right? Because if it were selling for a higher place in one, then it would just Move it. With these things, we're neglecting shipping costs and all that stuff, right? So it, it can't be that TV prices or DVD prices are different in the U.S. versus Mexico once we open it up to trade. That's the way these, these examples work. You can have a discrepancy when there's trade barriers, but once you open it up, the final prices of the goods, again, because we usually neglect shipping costs, are going to be the same. But let me just show one last thing, just to show, though, if you say, okay, but why is it that in the U.S., they're importing TVs. We say, what's the cost of making a TV in Mexico? And it's $22. That's the cost of production, right? Because you got to pay a worker $22 to take a day to make a TV. And again, in these examples, we're not thinking about any other inputs. In the U.S., after trade is open, what's the cost of making a TV? Well, the wage rate is $50 a day and the worker can make two TVs per day. So it takes half a day to hire a U.S. worker to make one TV. And so that would cost $25 in wages at the going wage rate. And so that's the sense in which, no, if we tried to produce TVs domestically in the new equilibrium, it would cost us $25 per TV. In contrast, Mexico is willing to ship us a TV for only $22. So you see how that works? So that's why, yep, Smith and Ricardo are right. Jorge is right. Murphy's right. 2005 Murphy. That you 
benefit international trade when you import goods that can produce, be produced more cheaply abroad than you can produce domestically hiring your own workers. That, that principle is true, but I think we can agree with this example illustrated, seeing what we mean by comparative versus absolute advantage just sheds a lot more light on that phenomenon and shows the diverse circumstances under which that will be the case for some goods. Because again, if you just said the principle, oh, import from where places where they can make it more cheaply than you can make it, especially if you're plagued with a labor theory of value, you might think that means, oh, import from those countries where it takes fewer labor hours for their workers to make it than it takes your work. And no, it doesn't mean that. Because again, this example shows it doesn't mean that. In the US, in this example, even once the trade barrier is removed, it is still the case that it takes the Mexican worker one day to make a TV. It only takes the US worker a half a day. So when we say TVs can be made more cheaply in Mexico, we don't mean in terms of labor hours. What we mean is in money terms. Okay, I will stop there. Again, folks, I'll post some relevant things uh, in the show notes page. And again, if you just listen to this audio, feel free to look at the video and we'll flash up some tables and whatnot. <laughs> this is showing these numbers as I was going through the exposition to make it easier. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. See you next time. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org.